What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Detroit Lions podcast. I'm Russell Brown. With me, my co-host, my partner in crime, 45 minutes up the road from me, Scott Bischoff, my man. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. We're good. talking a little, talk little pre-show, talking about our kids, their success with uh, some youth sports that we got going on here in the state. So that's always fun. But uh, I don't think anybody's signing up to listen to us talk ball about our kids. They yep. want to talk Detroit Lions. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, you know, Jeff and, and Chris have been kind to kind of give us this platform to talk a little bit about the Detroit Lions and things that we're seeing. We're going to be kind of those draft junkies for the for the group and for the brand, but also we're going to be doing a lot of different stuff as far as the breakdowns each week of what we saw from the Lions in a win or a loss of, of who their opponent was that week, and then just kind of getting you ready for the upcoming week and, and who that opponent might be. Um, you know, if we have time down the road, we might be able to knock out two of these a week. As of right now, we're just going to kind of stick to the one show format between the two of us. So if you guys want to uh, get in touch with all of that, you can find us on Twitter at Russ NFL Draft at Scott underscore Bischoff, or you can go ahead and like, subscribe, rate, and review the show on YouTube. So today it matters, but that, so the Twitter to my, it's at Bischoff underscore Scott, but again, I don't think it matters. So we're good. Uh, whatever. I, we're good. I knew I there was an underscore in there. I haven't whatever. said it. I haven't <laughs> said it in about a year. So give me a break. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so today's show going to be a little different. Week one going into week two, just kind of giving you that recap of week one. And then we're going to jump into, you know, sprinkling some Seahawks stuff, what we think we might see, get our opinions on it. And at the end of the day, one of us is probably going to be right, right. And maybe we'll both be right. Because uh, I, I think we have a lot of similar viewpoints when it comes to to talking football. So let's talk with the Chiefs. Week one, Lions are one and zero. A little surprised by this, I would have to say. Twenty one twenty, they pull this game out. Uh, I'm going to spin it to you. I mean, what was your takeaway offensively for the Lions in this game? What did you think were some positives? What were some things that maybe you you know were concerned about? So I, I thought that it was a very vanilla. Uh, approach on offense. I don't, you know, I, I, and I don't think I, I, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself on on getting uh, overly excited about this team, but I, I don't think they played great. I really don't. I, I, I was not their best performance. I'm sure some of that has to do with, you know, you're playing the Chiefs on the road. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's some of that there, but I don't know that they played a great game on either side of the ball, but you know, having said that, it was enough for them to to handle their business and stay in a game. Uh, obviously, coming back at the end there, uh, I think that you saw really good things from the their usage of Laporta. Um, I do. I mean, I think he can he can be a pretty dynamic in the seams, sort of stretching the field type of weapon. Uh, and we saw little glimpses of that. And, and then you look at a player like Gibbs. Montgomery, I thought was fantastic, but it totally expected. Like I, I thought, you know, with the way this team designs runs and, and how efficient they are blocking, he should really, he should really go off in this offense. Mm-hmm. But with the Gibbs, with Gibbs, you saw, you know, I've I've thought about him, um, pre-draft, post-draft, all this stuff. Comped him to Jamal Charles, just that slashing style, right? Where he's at, he's at the second level so quick. And then he's just so hard to hit, to square up and and you know really hit hard. Um, and he show I think he showed a little. He didn't have many touches, but he showed in those limited touches how dangerous he can be in the space, how hard he is to get to the ground. Uh, so that stuff has me excited. I think I thought golf played really well. Um, he's obviously in the middle of this this great streak that he's that he's uh, in the middle of. But you know the strength of that that off that offense is their offensive line. I'm a little worried about what's going on with Taylor Decker. They don't have, you know, that's a concern going forward is that's one of the positions where you don't have much depth is at, uh, you know, on the at the tackle position. What'd you see? What'd you think? No, yeah, no, I'm with you. And I, I, I was going to go with Taylor Decker as far as that's my biggest concern right now. I mean, what's going to happen at that left tackle position and, and what are we going to do in that spot? And I mean, I'm assuming he's going to play, but hearing the reports that he was in a walking boot and those types of things, that's a little concerning. Um, you know, you see the Seahawks, they're banged up. We'll talk about them, obviously, but 
both of their tackles, Charles Cross and Abe Lucas, they're battling knee and ankle injuries. They go out and bring in Jason Peters. So it's like, well, if it's really concerning, I feel like the Lions probably would have made a move and brought in a 41-year-old tackle like the Seahawks did. But again, I I, know in this team, I know they kind of, at times, it just kind of feels like with the Lions, they wing it, right? Like they just, they, they trust the coaching staff. They trust the process. They could put Sewell at left tackle, even though he is one of the best, if not the best right tackle in football. Uh, yeah. And they can figure out right tackle from there. They can run away from it. I mean, it's like when you when you run, a, when, like for for example, we run, we, we run a wing T offense and we don't need our left tackle to be elite in our offense. Obviously, that's different, but you can scheme it up and run away from it. And I think with the Lions, it's the same deal. They can run away from the left side if they need to or the right side. Um, so yeah, a little concern there. But I'm with you. David Montgomery looked good. He averaged three and a half yards a carry, 75 yards rushing. He had the touchdown, but it wasn't even so much the statistics. It was the running style. It was the yeah. downhill physical style. I'm with you 100% on Gibbs. I, I mean, I want to see a little bit more, obviously. I think we will this weekend against Seattle. I don't think you want to throw him out there in his first game against the Chiefs, physical defense, on the road, and have something go wrong in week one. Sprinkle him in get them adjusted, and roll with the punches. I think Seattle will be a little bit different. I think Seattle's defense is a little bit more beatable. Um, and I think with Gibbs, you're going to see him, I think, more in the passing attack. You bring up Sam Laporta to start. Completely agree. Five receptions, 39 yards. I loved seeing him move around. Having him at the X receiver, having him split out wide like that is key. And I think what really stood out to me was watching him aligned on the same side as Amon St. Brown. And St. Brown is able to run, you know, a spacing concept or a stick route or one of those types of deals. And Laporta is able to to clear vertically and get that safety or linebacker out of there. And it frees up St. Brown one-on-one with anybody he's matched up with. So I I think it's a key having Laporta in this offense. And I, I just want to say the sleeper of the offense was Josh Reynolds. Four receptions, 80 yards. He had the big slant route. He could be a key piece here for these first six weeks. That's been kind of the the the, the question, right? Who is going to be? Well, he kind of needs to, to be. Somebody right. needs to emerge as at wide re- at wide receiver two for them. Somebody does, right? Yeah. Who's going to be that guy? So, I, I think that's kind of the, the key. Who's going to be that wide receiver two? And and I think we we might have it with Josh Reynolds. Yeah, I mean, it's that's the hope is that you don't necessarily need to go outside and find help. Uh, I know everybody's talking about Mike Evans and all this other, you know. Um, I mean, that'd be, it'd be awesome, but they kind of are what they are at this point. Yeah. Uh, I would expect them to become more efficient and more dynamic as the weeks move along. I think they stayed pretty vanilla, uh, simply because of matchup and, and in week one, but I would expect to see Ben Johnson dial up some interesting stuff, uh, this week. Uh, you know, the Lions and the Seahawks tend to throw up points. So, uh, you know, I, I think well, you know, one of the matchups, and you mentioned that the the issues with Seattle, um, their tackles. Uh, I think that that in watching what the Lions, the, the defense did, I know Hutchinson was, you know, Hutchinson had some pressures and all that stuff, but there was more of a contain element to what they did on defense, just to try to keep Mahomes in the pocket because he's most dangerous when you when he's scrambling outside the pocket. It's like yeah. you know, he's a nightmare. So there's an element of let's just sort of squeeze. So this week, I think it's, we're, we're looking at a, a different scenario where I could see Hutchinson having a nice game, but I could also see James Houston doing really interesting things opposite him and maybe Charles Harris, whoever, whatever it is, just get them getting more um, pass rush production in a traditional manner. Uh, I'm interested to see what they do. How they blitz? Uh, what do they do with with a guy like Jack Campbell? I'll just tell people, um, just because Iowa never asked him to do anything really <laughs> rushing the passer doesn't mean he can't do it. You know, so there's a there's a variety of things that they can do. I'm I'm in, I'm really intrigued to see what what they do to Seattle on uh, on defense. How they how they dial up pressure and what it does to Geno Smith and what you know what they can do. Um, perhaps taking advantage of turnovers and that kind of thing defensively. And then, you know, maybe the offense just gets rolling. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I'm kind of, I, I mean, I'm excited to see all of it. It's just, you know, trying to temper it a little bit. 
Yeah, I'm w- I'm with you uh, as far as the game plan that they have with the Chiefs containing Mahomes. I mean, there's a reason why he's only sacked 20, 25 times a year. You have to contain him because if you bring all of that pressure all of the time, it leads to him extending plays, having a, a single receiver wide open in the middle of the field somewhere. It, it just happens. So I, I'm with you. I, I'm curious. Was Jawan Taylor, Was he was false starting, right? Like, I'm not the only one that saw that. He's 100% false starting, but he was also, they lined up generally, I would say, in an illegal formation the entire game. Yeah. Because so he has to be in the, uh, like in the framework of the center's belt line. Mm-hmm. So some part of it is his body has to like the let's just say his his face mask whatever or his helmet whatever has to be close enough to the line of scrimmage that he's you know he's breaking the plane of the center's belt line and he was he was significantly deeper than that yeah so but hey there are times when I'm driving down the road and I'm speeding am I breaking the law yeah but nobody's pulling me over writing a ticket I don't think no. I'm speeding. So, I mean, if the refs aren't calling it, what are you going to do? You no, know, I know. It, it, it just, it's one of those, it's like, it drives you nuts because you're watching it on every snap. And at first I was sitting there and I'm like, all right, I know I got a couple of cold beers in front of me, but there's no way this is, this is kicking in yet. You know what I mean? Like, I, I see what I'm seeing and yeah. then I recorded it and the clip blew up and then you know, you got Mike Tirico coming out and saying, well, you could, you could put an asterisk next to this win for Detroit. And it's like, hold on a second. How many times has Detroit had some type yeah. of bad luck on a loss or injuries, whether it was the Cowboys game with the, the no pass interference in the playoffs? You know, you go down the list. It's a long list. So it's like they got away with stuff just as much as anybody else. And it, it's just it is what it is. But no, I'm with you. I, I think with James Houston, uh, I would love to see him more on the field. I thought there were times that, you know, and I get it. We package our D line, which I love. The, the mainstay up front is Aiden Hutchinson. There's times that we got John Kaminsky and Benito Jones inside. We got Ali McNeil with Benito Jones. We'll have Isaiah Bugs back. So I, I get all of that. I'm excited about it. Uh, but I, I want to see James Houston more one-on-one, and I hope they can do that by maybe blitzing Malcolm Rodriguez or blitzing you know Gardner Johnson up the middle, or, or like you mentioned, Jack Campbell, just because he didn't yeah. do it doesn't mean he can't. Yeah. Brian Branch is gonna. I, Brian Branch is gonna be a stud. Can we just? He's gonna be a stud in this defense. Is he not? It's just. That, I mean, it's such a. Uh, I don't know how he falls to them. It's just like everything seems to. I, I see. I'm losing. The stars aligned. Something happened. They really did. And and I <laughs> and it's almost like. Am I am I having a fever dream about some of these things? Like at some point in time, I'm gonna wake up and Branch didn't happen, and you know. You know what I'm saying. So as a Lions fan, right as long as I've been, it just feels like don't get carried away. You just, mm-hmm. but then you start having these conversations about, okay, look at all the depth and the talent on this D line. Now we did, we haven't even mentioned Pascal, who I thought played really well. Um, and then you know we haven't mentioned Derek Barnes, who's really taking a step forward. And you know what I mean, like Derek Barnes' ability, his ability on on Thursday. To, as as a run defender, when he was scraping over the top, the the place that he slowed down because of his angle, his ability to scrape was so impressive. And then he was able to just dip his shoulder or work his hands with a swipe move, whatever it is, and get through and and meet that running back Pacheco or Edward Solaire, whoever it is, on the outside and make the tackle. And it's like that was just kind of eye opening and. Honestly, not a lot of people talked about Jerry Jacobs. There were times that he got beat in coverage, but there's also times where he just is absolutely locked up in coverage. He's playing yeah. man coverage when they go cover one and they're, they're manned up because they did that a lot of the time. I don't have the percentages in front of me, but he he was in man coverage and they'd run the drag route and he's coming across the field and making the tackle and forcing a fourth down. I've seen corners in Detroit that give up that play and a third and seven gets converted because of that. And yeah. he stopped it and he shut it down. So I yeah, think Jerry, it, J- yeah. They're just, they're, they're so much to like about what they have going on plus their depth. And I just don't, you know, that's like, it's, it's exciting because I don't remember feeling, I, I, there's always been this, all right, one injury away from disaster kind of thing. And it's like, all right, if you lose somebody on the D line, 
there are other players who can emerge. You know, multiple linebackers who who can do a variety of things. Uh, Branch and Gardner Johnson are are sort of like interchangeable pieces that are, you know, in the box type players who just can mix it up. Um, Jacobs, like you said, looked really good at times. Cam Sutton looked good at times. You know, like, uh, you know, we haven't seen Mosley yet. Um, I'm just, you know, there's just so much to to like about where they are. And, and then kind of big picture globally, just thinking, this is a team that really should be 2-0 through, through two weeks. Mm-hmm. And I don't think anybody would have thought that. Like, everybody would have thought, you know, it's possible they could be 0-2 after two weeks and still in a pretty good place. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's good. Oh. Yeah, I'm with you. And I, I think when you look at, uh, and I, again, I'm not going to go down the schedule and look ahead because the moment you look at Atlanta and Green Bay and Carolina, that's when things go bad. But I, I'm with you. As we prep for Seattle here, I'm really intrigued to see this home crowd with uh, CJ Gardner Johnson. I, I'm so intrigued by that with him with the ski mask. I mean, his energy, even when I was at training camp for a couple of days and watching, his energy is contagious, it's infectious. Yeah. And he is somebody that sets the tone defensively. He made some big plays in that game. You know, the uh, before the false start penalty at the end of the game, the last play, the, the, the second to last play, I, I should say, it was like third and 20. He made the pass breakup on that because they were in cover one. They were in man coverage. He read the tight end. The tight end was late to release upfield. So he floated underneath. He knew, one, the tight end wasn't going to get any deeper than he was. So he was fine. So he went underneath and broke up the deep pass. And had he not been there, that pass was probably completed. And that third yeah. and 20 then became fourth and three. And then yeah. we've we've seen that song and dance with the Lions late 100%. in the game. Yeah. Gardner Johnson made two great pass breakups. He did one on a spacing concept, that route. It just, he is so good. And I hope that the ball skills that we saw in Philly with the interceptions and all of that, I hope it takes off against Seattle because Geno Smith did not look good against the Rams. I don't know if you've watched any of that game. He didn't look good, in my opinion. He looked, he looked very rattled. Good. Yeah, he looked very yeah. rushed. And, they, and, and the weird thing was the Rams brought a lot of... Odd man fronts. They brought a lot of three man fronts with them because the Seahawks are running like this go go pistol type offense where they're running like out of twenty twenty one personnel. It's so weird. I'm curious if you've if you've seen that and what maybe your spin is on that. Maybe what how can Detroit defend that? Because I know we're going to see it. Um. Yeah, as far as like the twenty the twenty one personnel stuff, like uh. I can I understand what they're doing, trying to get Walker and Charbonnet on the field together, or, or you know, multiple in in a in a perfect world, mm-hmm. getting them both on the field together. How do you defend it? I don't know. You know, I, I mean, you do need you need like super athletic linebackers, and you know, the Lions have that. Yes. Um, I mean, you know, the the Seahawks do have. Skill position players that are that are scary. I mean, Metcalf is a is a frightening concept. Just yes. handling him, lock it underneath, running routes, sort of just shaking free and running into open spaces is, you know, it's potentially a troublesome thought. And then Jackson Smith and Jigba just kind of doing the you know what we saw at Ohio State, just superior releases and just you know and running into space too. But the ultimate uh, the the thing that breaks all that is pressure. And I think that the Lions are going to do. Um, you mentioned, you know, the concept of blitzing, and it's just like, there's a lot of ways to dial up pressure to make it so that it's easier for your defensive backs in coverage. And um, I know that I'm getting away from the the 21 personnel stuff, but I think it's all the same kind of thing that you, everybody has a gap up, you know, in the, in the front seven, and you know. If they want to run out of that kind of stuff, I'm not sure that changes much. Right. It just doesn't, right? And so it's just you're still gap sound. The question then becomes who's uh I would expect there to be lots of like hot passes kind of stuff where Smith is is pressured and the ball comes out hot and and kind of smothering that. Um you know, I just it lines up well for where the, for where the Lions are and where where with the issues that 
the Seahawks currently face. You know, uh, bringing in a 41-year-old tackle and playing him, you know, seven, six, seven to eight days, whatever it was, after you signed him, you know, I'm not sure that's a great thing, especially with the other tackle likely being still banged up. Right. So, you know, that's the hope is that, you know, the the Lions can bring so much pressure that it just really makes things very difficult for them on off for for Geno Smith on offense and it just throws them out of sorts. Um and it's just, you know, gap sound, speed, run to the ball kind of stuff. I know it sounds like coach speak, but it's <laughs> really there's no other way to defend, you know, defend your gap. So yeah, well, and when you watch Seattle, I, I, I mentioned the go go stuff where they'll put, you know, it's a it's a pistol formation with with Geno Smith, Kenneth Walker behind him and two tight ends. But there's times that they'll take that and they'll put, you know, you mentioned Charbonnet. They'll put, you know, Col- Col- Colby Parkinson and then Charbonnet or DJ Dallas. And uh, like, I feel like DJ Dallas has been playing in Seattle for the last 12 years. It's apparently only been four seasons, but <laughs> I, I found that out last night. I was like, hey, wasn't he in like the 2012 draft or something like that? No, it was four years ago. Uh, but no, in, in like when you watch their their route concepts, there's not a lot of crossers. I mean, sure, you get some here and there, but there was like a third and four and they ran three verticals. Like, I'm just yeah. very confused with what Seattle's going to do, especially if we're manned up. And we could man them up and bring Brian Branch down in the box with Jack Campbell, Derek Barnes, or Jack Campbell, Alex Anzalone, whatever. And then we could go ahead and still run a two high shell. The, the deep passes are taken care of. I trust our corners in man coverage. I'm not, I, I don't see anybody underneath like Parkinson or Walker, or even Charbonnet, dangerous enough to run a route like a Pacheco or a McCaffrey or anything like that. So, like, am I worried about this game? Sure. Seattle has our number. But yeah. th- th- again, this is just a different team. And, and Dan Campbell admitted they need to clean some things up. The stuff that we've talked about, they need to clean up. I think they clean up some of it. And, I think they end up winning this game. I don't know what your prediction is for the game, but I think they end up winning it. It's probably going to be a, a close one, 24-21, something like that. Yeah, it's, it would be, I mean, just kind of looking at it on, is today Wednesday? <laughs> today is Wednesday, brother. Yeah, um, that tells you how things have been going over here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> looking at it on Wednesday, it would be disappointing if they did not win this game. Just because of where... You know, just Lions have one issue, and that's that's a Taylor Decker issue. Uh, you know, I would I would say that teams have gotten overly cautious with putting people in, you know, putting injured guys in a boot kind of thing. And it doesn't mean like, you know, five years ago, if somebody was in a walking boot, they were they were in trouble. They were going to play for a while. And it's almost like putting somebody isolating somebody in a walking boot now is like a couple day thing, and then they're they're okay, kind of. You know what I mean? Like so. Um, I, I kind of expect him to play, and if he does, and he's capable, if he if he's at his level, the Lions should really handle themselves on offense. There's a lot of things that they can do. They've added a dynamic. They've added some dynamicism that they didn't have last year when they played against Seattle, and um, and Gibbs. And I just think that you know, getting him a few more touches, and then being able to extend drives, getting into good down and distance, and staying ahead of the sticks is just it's really what this offense should all, should be all about and doing it simply like i don't mean easily i mean like running the ball and staying ahead of the sticks you do that with with the heaviness of running power and those kind of designs with montgomery and then you have the splash stuff kind of off of that i i just i think that it would be disappointing if they didn't win this game and um you know i mean that's just where i am i don't you know i could see it being a 28 20, 24, like you mentioned, kind of a, a tighter game into the fourth quarter. And then maybe the Lions sort of taking, you know, scoring and just kind of pushing it past uh, what it seems like a close game. But, you know, let's hope uh, we could both yeah. be really wrong on that. Uh, and yeah, no, we're not. No, and, and I think with Seattle, I mean, their second half adjustments were terrible against the Rams. I mean, the Rams had their way. I mean, when, when you put on all 22 tape and the thing says 30, 35 minutes on it, you know your offense had a rough day. And when you put on the Seahawks offensive film, that's how much time there is. So, I mean, the second half flies by. They don't sustain drives. They're on the field very quickly. They're off the field very quickly. And, you know, for me, 
I think as long as you know Gibbs catches a touchdown in his home debut, uh, unlike DeAndre Swift did back in 2020 against the Bears, I think yeah. we're going to be just fine. Because uh, yeah. I think a lot of people want to pull that out of out of Gibbs. Well, he's DeAndre Swift 2.0. He's not. He's completely different. You mentioned Jamal Charles. I think he's going to be the star of the game. I think he's going to be the player that makes the difference. And I think these rookies are going to continue uh, to ball out for Detroit. So. I don't know. Admit, so we're both draft guys, right? And yep. it's like, okay, the Lions. Now, throw out, we've talked about this till to where I could punch the cat over it. <laughs> it sounds terrible that I don't mean that. I'm not punching my cat. But like, like the positional value stuff. I get it. I understand where, where people are really entrenched in that kind of stuff. But you added, the Lions have added uh, Jameer Gibbs. You added Jack Campbell. You added Brian Branch, um, Laporta. Roderick Martin's going to play a role, and then Hooker's down the line. You just don't know what you're going to get there, and it's just incredible to think that you added that group of players to a, a team that was already ascending, and those guys have already emerged to be making plays, bolstering what was already here. Yep. Like, what the hell is happening? Right. And we're, I don't. And you bring in a run anymore. Right. And you bring in established veterans like Cam Sutton, Gardner Johnson. I yeah. mean, it's. They want to play here. Right. And it, it just, it's just, yeah. it feels different. And the way I've summed it up on radio shows and things like that, it feel like I was, I was part of Cover One for a very long time. I was a part of the good days of the Bills and the bad days of the Bills. When the Bills became good, the way that that group of writers and podcasters felt is exactly how I think we feel and how that fan base felt in Buffalo when their team turned the corner, I think is how we feel. And it's just a weird feeling because you don't yeah, know. It, makes, it definitely makes me uncomfortable. Like, you know, right? I'm going to turn the corner. Somebody's going to kick me in the nuts and, and I'm going to wake up and it's like, none of this happened. Well, shit. It, exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. I, I mean, we'll see. Yeah, I, I can't wait for Sunday. I, I yeah. know it's going to be a loud crowd. I, I can't wait to see the blue ski masks. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Um, do you got anything else to add for this game? Anything else you want to you, you want to put out there? I, I, I'm good. I mean, I, I think we've summed it up pretty well. I have film breakdowns out on the LionsWire.com that kind of yeah. show show everything that I've seen from the Lions in Week One, and I'll have some Seahawks stuff later this week for us as well over there. Well, but everybody should be uh, hitting those up and then taking a peek at that kind of stuff. I just, I mean, I think the, the way you just summarized it is perfect. The excitement, and this is the way I'll leave it. The excitement around a game two game is ridiculous for this team. And that is just, that's the sum. That's it. That's everything. The, the amount of excitement that there is, um, the way that that building is going to be on Sunday, just, it's just going to be, it's going to be amazing. Uh, and you know everybody involved, and in, now whether Brad Holmes is right or wrong about a, about all these things, we have to give them we have to give them uh, credit for taking over what this team was three years ago, and here we are. What feels like in expedited fashion, uh, com- like flipping a it's a one eighty, yeah. and the excitement that everybody feels is justified. Mm-hmm. Um, I just that's where I'm gonna leave it. It's just it's it's the excitement is just off the rails. I, I'm excited just thinking about what Sunday's gonna be watching this game. I just am. I you know it's I'm super excited about it. No, I'm I'm with you. And I, I can't wait to see how this all plays out on Sunday. I, I can't wait to see, you know, what we do uh throughout the rest of the year. Get me to 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 January seventh, week eighteen, when the division title is on the line. Uh, I can't wait for it all. But you guys, of course, can get all of the the podcast information that you need from us at Detroit Lions Podcast. You can search it on YouTube. It's a bunch of great stuff. You can rate, review, subscribe to the show. Um, Scott, if you got nothing else, I got nothing else. I'm good. Videos we're randomly good. playing on my computer and nothing is open. So I don't know what's going on. We're uh, good. We'll uh, we'll hit this again in, in, a, in a week. And then uh, we'll see. I mean, you may be putting... Uh, individual stuff out on on uh, Detroit Lions podcast. I might as well. I did a, a pregame thing last year. I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do this year, but but uh, everybody will be seeing more of us, which, you know, maybe it's, it's, bad. it's a good thing for everybody, <laughs> but whatever. Too bad. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, no, we're good. Appreciate it, Thanks, everybody. Man. 
Thanks for having me, Scott. Thanks for talking with me. Um, we'll do this again next week. Sounds good. See you. 